All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this week's ultrasound grand rounds week number three, 2023. Hope you've enjoyed the, the first couple of weeks so far. Uh, today we have a pretty exciting topic. So I read an article came across my desk um, this last week or so that really got my interest. And I thought it'd be helpful to talk about this article um, and bring in an expert uh, to help me talk about it. So the article is basically about using lung ultrasound for chest physiotherapy. Um, and it's a, an article that's just come out, right? It's something that's brand new uh, and available to be seen. And since we don't do a ton of chest physiotherapy in the emergency department, but you do a ton of it up in the ICU, I brought on Dr. Ziad Shaman, my good friend and, and other host of this uh, this forum in, in previous sessions uh, to help talk to us about this topic. And so with that being said, we're going to dive right on into the use of bedside ultrasound for chest physiotherapy, right? So with myself and Dr. Shaman. And before we get going, I wanted to see, does anybody else happen to see something lurking in the lungs on this particular image? So there is some form of an alien creature that's peering out from behind the mediastinum, staring at you in this particular image. And I really want this image to be burned in your in your mind and your memories, um, because if you do not start using ultrasound for lungs in your patients who need chest physiotherapy, among other things, Dr. Shaman and I will be that alien that pokes out from behind the mediastinum and starts staring at you um, in a manner that would compel you to use ultrasound. Uh, so with that being said, all jokes aside, we are going to talk about how do we use ultrasound to assess patients and help optimize chest physiotherapy. Um, so let's dive right on in. You ready, Z? Yes, yes. Thank you for All having right. me. All right. Let's do this thing. So as we get started, we've done this in the past. And what I found to be helpful, at least in my own thinking, um, as we kind of process through this, is really establish a baseline for what the thing is that we're talking about, right? And then we'll dive into that particular topic and deep dive in on that one. So with that being said, our outline is going to be threefold today, essentially, well, kind of three and a half fold. Number one, what is chest physiotherapy, right? Number two, what is basic lung ultrasound? And number three, what does this article say, right? And then from there, we hopefully can come out with some practical applications that we can take with us to the bedside as we go into the emergency department and provide care for patients going to the unit. And then also um, for those in the unit who are taking over the patients from us and, and caring for them, you know, moving on, you know, days and weeks later. So anyway, uh, let's get rocking and rolling. So chest physiotherapy, right? It's a broad topic of things that happen uh, generally in the unit. And I'm going to step out of the way here in just a sec to really let Z elaborate on this one, because I think um, he's going to bring a, a lot more experience uh, to the table from, you know, with this topic than I would. Um, but as we get started, um, I'm going to violate number rule, rule number one for slide sets, and that is just have a really crazy, busy, boring slide, right? Um, but this is a, a table that that um, that talks about chest physiotherapy. And really, what I want you to see is that it's a complex, really specialty in inpatient management, where you can assess a patient, and you provide some form of therapy to their chest to provide some form of benefit to them. And there's a, a myriad of different uh, techniques you can use and reasons to use it. And so as I looked at this, right, as the dumb ER doc, I tried to boil it down into simplistic terms that really help us visually understand. And then Z, you can elaborate um, and tell me what I'm missing here. Um, but really wanted to break it down into the overarching goal, right? The 30,000 foot perspective, the why of what we do is number one, we want to improve the patient's quality and work of breathing right? Uh, we want to, they're, they're struggling for some reason, right? They're in the ICU, the pulmonary crit care folks are taking care of them. Their breathing is a problem. And we want to improve that as a part of improving their overall uh, health and, and, and care and their stay here, right? And we do that by doing three main things, right? Clearing secretions, so getting all the junk out of the airways. Number two, lung recruitment, so improving the, the number of alveoli that are available for gas exchange and their ability to do exchanging. And in the process of doing that, improve our P to F ratio or P to F matching, so our ventilation and perfusion matching. So we really have an optimized system that can get air through the pipes, into the diffusion beds, into the bloodstream, and then to the body where it needs to go, right? Um, and then there's various techniques that can be utilized. And as I looked at the list that Z sent, um, 
the top line represents mechanical things we can do to the patient, right? We can suction them out. We can position them. We can like bang on their chest with various different things. And number two is we can adjust our ventilation strategies, whether it's positive pressure ventilation uh, or like, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Like invasive ven ventilation with intubation or non-invasive with CPAP and BiPAP, but we can change our vent methods. We can adjust the pressure settings that we have for them. And we can, you know, inflate them to some certain degree, whether it be a, a preferentially hyperinflate or not um, in terms of managing these patients. Um, so with that said, I, before we kind of move on, Z, that's my dummy our doc views of chest physiotherapy, but do, would you like to expand on that and explain kind of a little bit more nuanced way for um, you know our audience here and those people who are watching later who may be more interested in the intensivist side of things? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we receive a patient who is not in their usual state of health, who's, who's bed bound and probably sedated or, or upfunded and, and sometimes intubated. Uh, and in that situation, we're gonna turn to the respiratory therapist and say, let's do some uh, some chest physiotherapy and then we kind of walk away and then it becomes the, the problem with the respiratory therapist uh, and sometimes they come back to us and say which part or which technique would you like to have or which technique you think would be most effective but the therapist is going to do uh, quite a few things they're going to assess if the patient can do things on their own if they're not sedated up funded or intubated uh, and that's uh, that that, that that actually is the most effective way to do chest physiotherapy when the patient efforts drives it. Uh, the second thing we're going to decide on uh, what, what's the best technique that works for the patient. Is it secretions or is it atelectasis? And as far as secretions go, uh, they're going to depend on the stethoscope and listening to the patient and asking them questions. Um, but, but when it comes to atelectasis, uh, they're probably going to look at the report of the chest x-ray. Uh, and, and sometimes they're going to turn to us and say, do you think this patient has a pneumonia or atelectasis? And we try to to, to think about it together to see what works best. The default, unfortunately, is uh, most of the time that the communication is disconnected. So it makes sense for the therapist to have tools uh, to use to decide on if there is a patient with atelectasis or infiltrate or pneumonia or something really different going about them. And, and it also makes sense for, for us uh, as the intensivist and the pulmonologist to know what are we starting with uh, so that when things progress or change, we have a, a, a window to look back uh, and see that, that, they, uh, that the patient developed something different from what they came in with. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the way we do this, uh, obviously, it's a lot of, you know, uh, RTs are kind of running the show uh, kind of in concert with the clinical team or the, the physician team. Um, how we actually get this done, you know, is going to be kind of another thing, another kind of layer to this. Um, and if we think about it, right. And again, as I look at this uh, and my understanding of, of kind of that, the chart that you sent and kind of how this happens on the floor is we can, we need to assess the patient, right. Decide what's going on and then provide some form of meaningful intervention and then assess whether that intervention was actually uh, helpful or appropriate or actually accomplished the goals of what we are trying to do. And so historically, uh, based on my reading and kind of what you've sent me, that happens in three main categories, right? We can assess them clinically, generally through auscultation. I mean, obviously there's going to be some form of a, you look at them, look at their work of breathing, see if there's retractions, things like that. But the clinical picture, mostly through auscultation, then some form of imaging, right? So we're going to assess their lungs through imaging. Um, and the third one's with these clinical parameters, you know, like we talked about P to F ratios, uh, looking at this ventilation perfusion matching kind of other numbers that we can pull off of either the vent or the patient's lab sets or the, you know, the monitor that would give us some, some indication of how the patient's, you know, progressing. So I don't know, you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so the therapist, what can the therapist do and how can we guide them to, to, to achieve that? If you leave a patient in the corner. Uh, they're going to develop secretions and not clear them. Um, and they will develop dialectasis either because of the secretions or because of compression of, of lung segments. And that will result in, in a P to F matching problem. They're going to have perfusion in areas that are not ventilated or ventilation in areas that are not perfused. So you talk to a therapist and, and assess the patient and, and you look at the tools that you have or, or the, the tests and, and assessment tools that you have. And then you come up with a plan. Uh, if I'm going to do suctioning alone, if I'm if my goal is to 
shake uh, shake the lungs so that the secretions can move. The secretion is able to cough, huff and cough those secretions. Um, or, or, or if I'm going to have to apply some uh, invasive or semi-invasive uh, techniques to improve the the intra uh, pulmonary pressure to to open up atelectatic parts of the lung uh, and and to and to do this in a in a in a consistent way uh, consistent with the images uh, things change uh, you you can't use one technique and, and think that it's going to work your, during the whole stay of the patient and also uh, you 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 might uh, apply a lot of preventive techniques uh, so that the patient doesn't develop that electrosis. So you might you might want to know even if the patient has an open lung uh, that that looks normal with uh, normal uh, VQ matching or P to F matching, uh, is that the person is not worsening over time. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question or if there was something else I can talk about. You know, I think it's it's helpful to just kind of establish kind of a baseline for what we're doing. Um, maybe I, I'm going to show some pictures here, um, and maybe you can kind of comment on what we're seeing, and then kind of what you would be thinking about as you, um, you know, are going through your different stages of, of the chest physiotherapy. So uh, here's our our you know our X-ray image. So um, I mean, make this uh, clinical scenario whatever you choose, but there's clearly some you know some form of um, you know, consolidation, you know, presumably atelectasis in this case. Um, what are your thoughts about how you'd kind of proceed with this one in, from a chest physiotherapy standpoint? Oh, yeah. Just, just looking at the x-ray generally, uh, I have a, uh, a normally inflated lung uh, with, uh, uh, with, an, uh, with an ET tube in place and then uh, probably a feeding tube that goes next to it down to, the, uh, to half of the chest that hasn't been advanced further. Uh, there is no pneumothorax, there is no apparent air below the diaphragm, uh, and no extra hardware uh, inside the chest. The, the lung uh, parenchyma is, uh, is congested, uh, partly because of the ex excess soft tissue uh, superimposed on the lung uh, field. But, but also, there is loss of the left hemidiaphragm, complete loss of the left hemidiaphragm, although some of it is below the, the, the picture uh, cutoff. And the right has a, a hazy pattern to it um, that is consistent with either fluid infiltrate or atelectasis and on both sides. And that's what you will get from the x-ray. You're not going to get a distinction between the types of pathology that can affect uh, the, the lungs, but you can, you can only see the effect of it on, on, on a two-dimensional reconstruction of, of a three-dimensional structure. So it's quite limited. Uh, I, I don't see particularly air bronchograms. Uh, I see a little bit of a of a of, of the left uh, the left main going across over the top of the heart, the right main uh, kind of kind of ending somewhere by the heart border or the mediastinal border. Uh, but the, there isn't much of an air uh, open air in an area of consolidation. So if that helps, uh, it it kind of if you see an air bronchogram, it helps you be more certain of an alveolar filling process than atelectasis, but if you don't see it, then, then you don't know. Thank you. Um, so with that said, with kind of that background in mind, what I'd like to do is kind of move to our next introductory kind of aspect to lung or to this topic, and that is talking about lung ultrasound. Um, and then we'll put it together with this article that we that we're looking at. So the idea of lung ultrasound is something that's kind of developed in the you know the ED and the critical care sphere um, over the last decade, couple decades, I guess, um, and has really been utilized you know very broadly uh, to assess patients with pulmonary complaints. Um, and so I guess the first question that we need to is talk about, and, and a lot of the people who are at least on today's call and then we'll be watching this later, will probably have some cursory. Uh, understanding of lung ultrasound, but maybe just to kind of fill in the gaps and and kind of set a baseline, the lung ultrasound looks at a couple different things, right? Um, you're asking yourself a few different you know questions um, as you scan the lungs, and it's very dependent on where you are scanning in the lungs. And so, if you want to get a a nice thorough view, like a single chest X-ray would, I mean, thorough in that comprehensive understanding of both sides, you know, top to bottom, you need to scan, um, you know, front side and back of the lungs in the typical, you know, six zone per side um, algorithm that's essentially been been agreed upon, you know, 
uh, with the international guidelines, but you're looking for a number of things. Number one, you're looking at lung profile, right? So is it an A profile? Is it a B profile? Or do you start seeing some consolidations? And by A profile, and we'll show some pictures here in a minute, uh, we're talking about, do you see that pleural line, right? And the reverberations of that pleural line that re represent normal thickening of the, or the normal thickness of the alveolar interstitial, you know, layer, essentially. Uh, as you thicken that for various different reasons, you'll get that B profile. You you'll start seeing B lines appear that start becoming that B profile, uh, which is starting to represent what I've described here in the slide is the alveolar interstitial syndrome, but can also represent things like pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary edema or interstitial pneumonia, um, you know, or even to some degree atelectasis uh, will show up as this thickening of that, um, the, the alveolar interstitial space uh, that re is represented by B lines. And then as you progress to further consolidations where you no longer have just thickening of that space, but actual filling of the alveoli that are condensing into just a a solid, essentially lung, whether it be with, you know, infection or secretions or what have you, um, then we're going to start seeing that consolidation pattern uh, that will be representative of, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, low bar pneumonia, or um, you may see that in the, you know, in a contusion or an infarct or things like that. Uh, and so we'll see that in the form of either just a shredding up of the pleural sign. We've got some images here to show in just a minute of that. Um, or, you can actually, if it's like a complete low bar consolidation, you can see just the, the lung becomes, starts looking something like a liver um, as you have that, just the, the tissue. It's, I mean, the, the hepatization uh, of that tissue uh, on, on ultrasound, right? So that's the, the first thing we're looking for is kind of what profile, A, B, or C. Uh, the second thing we want to look for is, you know, lung sliding. And I mean, you probably should put sliding first, just theoretically, because it's mm -hmm. easiest. Um, but does that lung move back and forth with, with respiration, uh, which would suggest that the lung, the visceral and the parietal layer of that lung or that pleura are in complete opposition to one another um, and, and are moving freely. And when you destroy that interface, whether it be through lack of movement uh, or it's stuck together, uh, or it's completely separated, then you lose that lung sliding, right? Um, and we'd have basically essentially, you know, no sliding, uh, which would represent, you know, depending on your clinical situation, a pneumothorax, or, you know, whether they've had a pleurodesis in the past, or they're, you know, flat out apneic, you know, those are things that would kind of preclude you from seeing sliding. Um, and then finally, the third thing that you were looking for on the lung ultrasound is, is there fluid surrounding the lungs? So this idea of pleural fluid, um, you know, you can put stuff in the lungs. That's fine. You can, you can make the lungs move or move or stop moving, but you can also put fluid um, or things around that lung, which would separate that lung from the, you know, the chest wall. And that can be pretty easily seen with ultrasound practice. You know, in fact, probably better seen with ultrasound uh, in many ways than, than with x-ray. Um, and that would, you know, be indicative of like a pleural effusion, a hemothorax, chylothorax, or whatever thorax, you know, you want to essentially to do, um, but you'd have um, basically fluid around that lungs. And so let's look at some pictures just to kind of illustrate this here. Um, here's an example of just a normal lung, right? So this is using the curvilinear transducer. Um, you can see that lung sliding back and forth. You can see an occasional B line. I mean, we're not dry as a bone normally. We have some degree of of moisture to us. And so you're going to see an occasional B line uh, in that interspace, but you can definitely see the reverberation of the pleural line deeper in the lung tissue uh, that's represented at A line. So that's normal, right? And we can actually do the exact same thing um, with a different transducer. So this is using the linear transducer, and you can see that lung sliding very well. And this is just an example that I did on myself, um, you know, several years ago, which is why my name's on it. It's not a HIPAA violation because it's me. Um, and um, you can see that lung sliding and that reverberation of the A-line uh, deeper into lung tissue, suggesting that this is a normal, um, a normal window in this, in this particular lung. Now, remember that one and contrast that with this, right? And so we can see lung sliding, okay, on this patient, uh, but we see significantly more B-lines, those lines that begin at the pleural surface and emanate all the way down to the bottom of the, the lung field, right? They look like a flashlight in fog. Uh, and as this is going to be, uh, a significantly greater number of B lines than what would be considered normal, right? Three or less in an interstitial space or in a rib space is, is normal. So this one's nearly confluent B lines. So this would suggest that alveolar interstitial syndrome or the increasing thickness of that, um, that interstitial space surrounding the alveoli for whatever reason, right? Now you got to correlate clinically with, you know, where is this? Is it unilateral, bilateral? What's the clinical scenario around this? That would help you understand that a little bit better, right? 
Uh, moving further down the ladder, this one's an example of just some um, subpleural consolidations, right? So this is a patient with likely viral pneumonia. Um, and you can see that that pleura, which is normally smooth as it moves back and forth, looks like one of my kids got to it with a pair of scissors, right? Uh, my kids love finding scissors right now and just randomly cutting things. Um, and so this is an example of a pleura that one of my kids got a hold of um, and just started shredding with a pair of scissors. I say it in jest, you know, but uh, it, and it's what it's called. It's a shred sign, right? And it suggests it's a small little microscopic consolidation that's starting to destroy that normal air interface that we would expect to see, um, you know, in a, in a normal healthy lung. Um, as we move further down the ladder, I mean, here's an example of some fluid around the lung, right? So you can see that black fluid uh, that's above the diaphragm that illustrates the spine deep to it or you know, exposes the spine deep to it. And you can see that consolidated lung just floating inside that fluid. And I think this is one thing that we're going to see later on in our conversation is this may be indistinguishable from just a flat out lobar pneumonia on your x-ray. And it may be an opportunity for our chest physiotherapy to kind of have some ability to nuance the, the treatments based on what we see. So tuck that in your head, uh, but it's a pleural effusion. And then we got a couple examples of consolidation. So this is an example, uh, a consolidated lung here. Uh, you can see it looks an awful lot like a liver, but there's a whole bunch of bright white lines in it. Uh, and so this is a lung consolidation with a static air bronchogram, right? So it's got air in the lungs. Um, and then as you uh, look at, you know, patients who may have a pneumonia, um, Here's an example of dynamic air bronchogram. So if you watch carefully, um, actually, you know what? That one's the example of dynamic air bronchograms. As you watch carefully, you can see those little white lines that represent the air spaces. They kind of move in and out with the patient's respirations. And this is, you know, pretty indicative of this patient has some sort of consolidated process, you know, likely a pneumonia uh, that would be seen with a low bar, you know, low bar consolidation, these, these dynamic air bronchograms. So that's a basic overview of lung ultrasound in, you know, about three minutes. Uh, Z, did you want to add anything or did I miss anything that you want to share from your perspective about that? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I see that uh, this is a really good, good example of uh, air bronchogram. And, um, it tells me that uh, the airways are not completely collapsed. So there's still air moving in and out, uh, but indicated by the white areas that are uh, sliding in and out. Uh, and that, that gives me uh, a good impression that uh, probably in this case, uh, percussion uh, plus suctioning is going to be more effective than, uh, than a hyperinflation technique. So I can work with the therapist to decide what's gonna be the best approach. It's a great example because it's one of your slides. Um, <laughs> so got to throw that. So credit to Dr. Shaman for this particular, uh, this particular image. That's why I said it was a really good one, but, um, let's with that basis, um, uh, move forward and talk a little about the article, right? Cause I think this is going to be interesting, uh, put some data around this. And then you and I have kind of teased a little bit, um, you know, the people who are watching this about how this might be applicable. And I think we can come back to that and just really do some practical applications at the end here. Um, but the article is, um, published. It's actually a 2023 article. I think it's in a, it's like a preprint in press uh, slated to officially come out later this year. Um, but it somehow ran across my desk uh, in the form of an email or um, on some article feed thing. Um, I think it's an article journal feed that I subscribe to. Uh, but anyway, it is entitled Quantification of Changes in Lung Aeration Associated with Physiotherapy Using Lung Ultrasound in Mechanically Ventilated Patients, a Prospective cohort study. And this was done by our friends down under um, in, in Australia. Uh, and so I'll throw up the abstract. I don't expect you to read this uh, at this point. And we, uh, we'll put links in um, the YouTube video that, that gets published you know, later on uh, with this article, as well as some other supporting articles uh, that are really, really helpful on this topic if you want to do some further reading. But essentially what they did is they selected about 43 people uh, who were in the ICU, who were intubated, who were getting chest physiotherapy. And we'll define what that means in just a minute. And they did a bunch of pre-session uh, parameters and they did post-session parameters, right? And those parameters were uh, a modified um, RAS view um, on x-ray. So it's their atelectasis scoring. Um, uh, I think it's a radiographic atelectasis scoring. Uh, so an MRAS score. They did a pre and post ultrasound, right? Looking at different parameters there. And they did pre and post, you know, clinical parameters. So like PF ratios, um, tidal volumes, auscultation scores, things like that. So really trying to get a, 
a, an understanding of what are the ways that we currently assess these patients to see if our physiotherapy is effective. Um, and then we're going to throw in this ultrasound pre and post and see, is that effective? And how does it compare with all of the other modalities that we're using? Chest x-ray, clinical parameters, things, things of the like, right? So that's the whole goal. Um, and we'll bypass the conclusion here shortly because we're going to come back to it. Um, but the inclusion and exclusion criteria, they basically picked decently adult-sized people, so over 18 years old, hospitalized, getting mechanically ventilated, suspicious for atelectasis, right? And then they had a couple other miscellaneous parameters um, that got them into the study. And there's a few things that got the people out of the study, but generally no arguments on kind of your inclusion, exclusion. They got a, a cohort of people from the ICU who needed chest physiotherapy, who were getting all those stuff and included them in the study and ultrasound of them, right? And so they use the ultrasound te technique that I referred to. This is the six zone or 12 zone, however you want to look at it, technique uh, that's been kind of agreed upon by all ultrasound experts or all lung ultrasound experts is to kind of the, the typical way that we're going to arrange the, 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 the windows. So two up front, so kind of from the sternum to the anterior axillary line, uh, upper and lower using the nipples kind of a, a bifurcator, right? Then you're going to do between the anterior and posterior axillary line um, as your zones three and four with the same line indicator. And then if you wrap that, line, that horizontal line around to the back, you could do basically from the spine to the posterior axillary line, um, that's zones five and six. And so that's really going to catch all the different areas of the lung. Um, and then you replicate on the other side. So you have a total of 12 zones. And if you remember way back uh, a couple of years ago, when we did our COVID lecture, uh, we talked about this technique uh, being utilized for the COVID. I think they added a third in the back um, on that one, on the studies that they did for that. But you'll see this, this um, framework for how they're doing the long ultrasound kind of replicated across studies, right? This is kind of the universal accepted standard. Um, so the comparison things here, um, essentially the MRAS, the modified radiological atelectasis score, they gave the x-rays a score of zero to three, right? Based on the presence or absence of atelectasis and how much, right? And then they, they, gave, they assigned a lung ultrasound score um, from a scale of zero to three as well. Um, zero being an A pattern, one being a B pattern uh, with just enough um, B lines to call it a B pattern. Number two is a, a B pattern that's a lot more, right? So you have uh, a crowded or coalescent B lines, you know, with or without subpleural consolidations. And then and number three was that total consolidation, effusions, pneumo, kind of all the other big guns uh, when it comes to um, what you're looking for on lung ultrasound. So they use, they, they create that scoring system. They scored the patients pre and post and then evaluate it, right? Here's an example of kind of that, a patient with plate-like atelectasis on that MRAS. So this would be like a score one uh, on the MRAS here. Um, here's someone who's got more extensive atelectasis. This would be like a score two um, on the MRAS score. So just kind of giving you a visual indicator of what um, kind of what was what. And then the ultrasound images that I showed here uh, are various representations of things. So the middle is that confluent B lines. It's going to be a score two. The one on the right, is going to be that, um, the um, uh, I'm blanking. The subpleural consolidations also a score two. The one on the left can be a little less B lines, uh, probably more of a score one. Um, obviously, I don't have a consolidation to show a score three, but we've seen that earlier today. Uh, so that's kind of what we're what they looked at, and then the chest physiotherapy treatments. So what they documented in terms of what they did was suctioning. So some combination of suctioning, uh, like percussion vibration. Uh, positioning the patients, some ventilation techniques, and then these kind of assisted coughing uh, to see, you know, what worked uh, for these patients. And the table too really gives the outcomes, right? And so uh, this is where I think the the interestingness in this article comes to play. And I think we can then extrapolate this into to learning how we can use this at the bedside, right? So uh, top line lung ultrasound score. They did that to total composite score, and then they. Um, divided up left and right. And what they did is they did a scoring system for each lung zone, right? So if you notice, um, you know, the scores for the total lung ultrasound score is a lot higher than the, the x-ray scores. The x-ray score was basically, is it, you know, zero, one, two, or three. In the lung ultrasound score, it was up to three per zone. Uh, so you could have, you know, a large number of, um, of possibilities there, right? And so, 
they showed that pre time zero pre lung physiotherapy, there was a, a an average lung ultrasound score um, of about 13, right? Uh, and then post well, um, chest physiotherapy, there was a lung ultrasound score of 10 or 10 and change, right? So what you saw is about a three point decrease on the lung ultrasound score as a result of getting chest physiotherapy. So patients went from a slightly higher amount to a slightly lower amount uh, on that scale, which would potentially represent some improvement in, you know, in, in the parameters, right? In the presumably in the amount of lung that was recruited or available for oxygen exchange based on, on the big thing here is your B lines, right? Um, interestingly, though, the chest x-ray didn't change a ton, right? In fact, it slightly went up. Now, I'd say it's probably within, you know, the, the confidence interval crosses zero. And so it is statistically insignificant at this point, but it goes from 2.9 to 3.1. So the chest x-ray, we're, we're going to say for all intents and purposes, is essentially unchanged in the course of time that this patient had their chest physiotherapy, right? And then if you look at their other scores, like their auscultation score changed, their PDF ratio changed, their the ventilation uh, changed, all that stuff changed. Um, and so I think, you know, what we're seeing, particularly in the P to F ratio, we see an increase in 10 on the scoring system, which I read it as basically saying their P to F ratio increase, which means they, the lung is becoming more and more efficient uh, in the amount of oxygen that it can carry or, or can diffuse. And so I'd expect to see a discordant change between the lung ultrasound score and the P to F ratio in particular, if we're looking at, you know, ventilation perfusion matching. So um, that's kind of my read on things that the lung ultrasound shows benefit as a result of chest physiotherapy, and it shows benefit in the direction that we'd expect to see some with some clinical parameters. And it probably shows it a little bit more effectively than some of the other parameters. Um, Z, do you have, uh, how do you look at this data? How do you, how do you read this data or anything you want to add on that? I have the, um, the lung ultrasound, like, like you said, uh, has, has a lot more point values than the MRAP. Uh, there, there is a there is a, a significant change statistically significant the total on the right the the left didn't show it but uh, the, the the primary outcome was really the uh, the total lung uh, um, ultrasound score which was significantly different of, of about three points out of uh, ten to or thirteen which seems to be a, a big enough number um, the MRAS score. I want to say that they did the x-ray uh, before the chest physiotherapy, and then they did another x-ray the day after. So it wasn't immediately after, uh, it was a day after. So maybe things did settle back to where they were the day before, or maybe x-ray just lagged behind. And, and while there, there might be a change, but you can see with the ultrasound, you might not see it with the x-ray, Sim similar to us when when we suspect an pneumonia, the chest x-ray clear, and then the ultrasound shows you what looks like consolidation of their bronchograms, and then you kind of believe the ultrasound to be more sensitive uh, than the plain, uh, plain chest x-ray. The p to f ratio did increase a small amount, not statistically significant, but at least it didn't go in the wrong direction. Um, it, it, it still went in the right direction. Um, that, that, that's how I look at it. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, one, one more point is that uh, of, of everybody that they screened, uh, they only excluded uh, less than 3% of the people they screened because of inability to do ultrasound. They either had uh, a chest uh, uh, body wall habitus or a pathology that limited the utility of ultrasound. So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm uh, pretty, uh, positively uh, surprised that uh, the exclusion based on inability to go on ultrasound in such patients was uh, less than 3%. So that's, that's a reassuring thing. Good. Well, thank you for, for that. Um, so I guess as we kind of move on, you know, from the article, and I, we're not going to really move on, we're going to kind of apply it now. Um, what do you think, Z? How does this, do you think this article moves the needle for you? And if so, how? And, um, you know, what, wow. what, what do you think our applications should be in the unit uh, or even in the ED as a result of, of reading this article um, with what we've been talking about today? Yeah, we're, we're a biased group. We're ultrasound uh, fa favored, favoring. Of course. Uh, but, but, but I want to say that uh, the, the article introduces something that's a little different. 
uh, and, and I like it because it, it puts the tool in the hand of the physiotherapist. Um, it, it adds to the tools of the physiotherapist other than looking at the P-TERF ratio, uh, examining with a the, with the stethoscope, uh, we've moved on at, by adding the ultrasound to the stethoscope, but, but the ultrasound, but the uh, chest physiotherapist or the respiratory therapist haven't had that yet as far as I know. So adding this tool makes sense because now you're not dependent on a static image that happened the day before or the day after your intervention. You can immediately see the effect of what you're doing on the patient with the tool in your hand. I like it a lot because it, it gives the therapist uh, immediate feedback on how they're doing with the patient if the patient needs one particular therapy rather than another. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's a, that's a new thing. Um, as far as as far as the article, uh, I want to say that um, the the numbers are small. Uh, I agree, but uh, not to be too critical. A lot of our physiologic studies are done on small uh, ends as a proof of concept before you go on to clinical outcome. Uh, but nobody was hurt because of it. Uh, uh, people did have some sort of impro improvement in one measure uh, or another. If if it didn't if it didn't correlate with the chest X-ray, they are two different techniques. And I tend to believe the ultrasound findings more than the chest X-ray findings, to tell you the truth. Um, as far as uh, the utility, um, uh, I want to say that uh, there is a lot that gets lost in translation between the patient coming to the emergency room, getting intubated, and the time I see them in the ICU the next day uh, or a few hours later, uh, where I find that the person is more hypoxic, the chest X-ray shows me something, something that I can't interpret uh, clearly. I look with the ultrasound and I wish I had a pre-image. This is where I look with the ultrasound and say, is this something I expect to happen because of an aspiration pneumonia and this is a natural progression of the pathology? Or is this something because of the intervention, because of the intubation and laying on the back, laying on, on the, the patient laying on their back and the paralysis that we applied? Is this something that will respond to one sort of physical therapy, one sort of chest physiotherapy or another? I wish I had a pre-image. Uh, and this is where probably the emergency room role comes in really, really handy uh, with, uh, with, with an opportunity for us to figure out what, what changed and what we can do. Um, I, can, I can definitely use the ultrasound to record the images as I'm going forward, uh, but looking back it is, it has a lot more value. Gotcha. Well, so I guess maybe we can say this out, just put it out there. Um, I don't know, maybe this will be a little bit controversial or not, but would do you think it'd be fair to say that, you know, most patients who come up from the ICU with a respiratory complaint should come up with a baseline ED ultrasound um, in general? Like, even if it wow. doesn't really move the needle for us downstairs in terms of does this change patient management for me personally in the department? Of, of course, I would say so, but, but reality is different. <laughs> I can't put the burden, all of the burden on all of the patients who present with respiratory complaints, uh, but there are the people who you know are going to get in trouble uh, yeah. and, and, and you receive them and, and, uh, and you escalate the treatment from a couple of liters to, to high flow to an intubation within, within an hour. And then you say, oh my, uh, I think this person is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to have a protracted stay or a very severe disease. Uh, or just starting with the x-ray. If the x-ray shows you uh, something convincing, diagnostic, then you can say, okay, I, I know what I'm dealing with. But if it gives you that, that x-ray picture of consider this and this and that, clinical correlations recommended, I would say, yes, please add, add an ultrasound picture. It helps a lot because the x-ray is, is gonna continue to be uh, confusing or it's not gonna be specific. Uh, and, and adding one, one, one more piece of information uh, is useful. Uh, now, how much effort uh, that includes? Uh, you're probably scanning the patient already, uh, but 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 do, but but saving the picture and adding a report and uploading this to the system uh, is uh, is added for them. Uh, I realize this, so I would say maybe not everybody. Maybe the ones who you have uh, either a confusing presentation or or you have a severe disease that's in progression. Sure. Yeah, and for the naysayers out there, I mean, I think. Someone's going to say, well, not every intensivist is going to be able to interpret the ultrasound like, like you can, um, you know, the ED is a busy environment, um, things like that. And, um, so I guess the way I'd probably 
put it is say encourage our our ed colleagues to do more uh, long ultrasound to establish that baseline, um, understanding that there's parameters that would probably keep us from being super dogmatic about it right now. Um, but I think one of the things, that, one of the traps that we kind of get into is I'm not going to do X because it's not going to have a direct impact on the, my decision making right now. Right. Um, and while I think that's a very good first screening test to ask ourselves in the department, you know, should I order a serum ceruloplasm? Will I actually, in, you know, will I actually act on that test? You know, no. So maybe I shouldn't order that test. Sometimes we can maybe fall off that horse, that side of the horse too much. Um, and that we don't have a broad systems understanding of the patient's, you know, care that's going to happen outside of my department and where my care may you know, set up, you know, the bump set spike for you guys up in the unit um, to then be able to, to pick up the ball and run with it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one out there, um, you know, for all my ED colleagues to, to criticize, but, you know, I like it. Um, but I, I want to add that maybe it's maybe because everybody who is sick, uh, who's on BiPAP or CPAP, who, who's got an, uh, an ET given plate will have a respiratory therapist there. So yeah. why, why not take the tool uh, and maybe uh, maybe make a lot of the respiratory therapists able to use it. I mean, we've had the medics and, and the nurses and a couple of other healthcare professionals use ultrasound in their prospective field. Um, it, it makes sense. I mean, uh, in that case, a sign out can go between one therapist from the emergency room who received the patient initially, goes to the ICU respiratory therapist with this is what I saw on the ultrasound. This is what I initiated, uh, and it's in, in your hands now. And they have the pre, and they have the knowledge to do the current, and they have the knowledge to do the post. And and, and may, maybe even, of course, the physicians, uh, physicians would probably want to know what's going on. But in reality, we're going to turn to the therapist and say, please start just as your therapy. And I, I'm not going to guide them a lot more than that unless there is an issue and there's, then, then a conversation happens. Uh, why, why not leave the tool in the hands of people who, who are there by the bedside rather than uh, me who is sitting uh, be behind the computer desk? And, and uh, It's actually not, not a bad idea. I mean, we started doing the concept like that with our life bank folks years ago. Uh, Zia, I think you were involved in that study um, initially where we were looking at, can we use lung ultrasound to recruit lungs for... Um, you know, neurologically diseased candidates that could then, we could then use the lungs, harvest the lungs for transplantation. Um, and so there's a couple of studies, we did the initial study and then Dan and his team kind of took the, took it to the next step and did the next study. Um, you know, and that was the goal is to get that in the hands of the people who are managing the, those individual patients to, you know, you know, post neurological death essentially. Uh, but yeah, I, I love the idea of just having, you know, equipping and arming um, our RTs in the department who are going to basically have a foot in both worlds, going to transcend both worlds, uh, sp physically speaking, not metaphysically speaking in this case, you know, from, from the, the ED to the unit, um, you know, and using that as the tool to be able to have that continuity in, in terms of imaging care. Um, so great idea. Um, with the, whatever time we have left, which isn't much, I'm going to throw a couple images at you. Okay. And we're just going to say, what would you do? Right. Um, besides, Hey, RT, can you do chest physiotherapy? But maybe we can tease out a little the nuance of how this is going to be beneficial um, in terms of providing the um, the care to the patients that that um, that we're going to provide, right? So, uh, so here's our image number one. And these are all images that we've we've shown already, right? Um, but this patient comes in, and I, okay, so we'll have to suspend disbelief a little bit because a lot of the chest physiotherapy techniques are probably going to be related to what does the patient present with in terms of their clinical presentation, but in this situation, right, um, this patient has significant amount of beelines that are nearly confluent. Um, if you looked at this image, right, and assuming that this is consistent across the different areas of concern in the lungs, what techniques would this potentially prompt from you um, from a chest physiotherapy standpoint? Uh, I, I would see this and say there is an, uh, there is a, real, uh, a process that might result in an alveolar filling uh, event, uh, and this could be someone with heart failure who, who, who's coughing up a bunch of phlegm, or it could be someone with uh, a uh, viral respiratory illness who's coughing up a lot of secretions. And in that, in this case, suctioning probably first. I know the physician is going to say, "I want to re reduce 
preload and afterload. So apply some positive pressure uh, and, and that's it. But I'm probably not gonna be shaking this patient a lot because uh, uh, because this this has not resulted in a collapse in a lower collapse unless I suspect it's gonna result end there and I need to prevent it. Sure. Now, next patient that we have, um, let's see if I can go to an X-ray here that will be illustrative. Um, the one on the right. Um, so we have the patient with basically. Uh, so some dense consolidations on both sides, complete loss of the, the distinct hemidiaphragm on both sides. Um, and the chest x-ray, the radiologist says, hey, look, we have some consolidation. It could be atelectasis. It could be uh, pneumonia. It could be a fusion. It could be an infarct. It could be anything, you know, histiocytosis X, you know, it could be whatever you want it to be. You need to correlate clinically because this is just an x-ray, right? Um, so you then go scan the patient and you get this. All right. Um, how does that? Um, well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah I mean, like, how, I how mean, do you how you manage this one? I mean, the read of the X-ray was not wrong. It could be atelectasis, could be effusion, uh, and I see an effusion. I see compressive atelectasis. This is not going to open up with shaking. Uh, this is someone who needs diuresis or drainage of fluid if there is a suspicion of infection. Uh, or, or a hematoma and, or, or a hemothorax. And then after that, uh, maybe a hyperinflation would give the patient a head start on, on, on open up, opening up the lobes. And if the, if the x-rays were, were uh, in time sequence from right to left, uh, pre and post, uh, then the post actually showed that the, the diaphragms were both visible at that point. Um, what about if the patient presents like this? Same, same x-ray. Uh-huh. Now what? Now this is the X-ray that you have. Now what do you do? Uh, so although there's an effusion, there's a little bit of a fluid uh, above the diaphragm. Uh, although the dark area in the middle of the picture is the rib shadowing uh, over the lung, the, the rest of the lung is compressed. Uh, there are air bronchograms. There are white lines within the area of the alveolar filling, and this is consistent with. Now it could be either or. It could be either an alveolar filling process from an infection that started in the alveoli. Or it could be that this is compression from something else. Uh, now, this is not an airway collapse because the airways are open. Uh, so this person is probably going to be treated as a pneumonia, which is consistent. The small effusion is consistent with that. Uh, and secretions and shaking make sense. Hyperinflation doesn't make sense because the lung didn't collapse because there's an airway issue or lack of air flowing into the, into the parenchyma. There is something in the parenchyma. If I saw air bronchograms that are dynamic, I would be a little more sure about this. But in this case, yeah, like like, like this picture, uh, there is small effusion above the diaphragm surrounding the lung, there's a shadow on the, on the, on the other end, but this is a, uh, this is a, a, a velar filling process. It could be blood, it could be pus, it could be fluid. This person, other than secretions, needs a lot of, uh, a lot of shaking. Uh, and and that that will probably be the best of both. Sounds good. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time, um, so I think we'll kind of wrap things up here. Um, but I thought that was really helpful discussion, kind of about a really kind of a novel way of using lung ulcer, at least from my perspective, I hadn't really run across this before. Um, and so I think it kind of provides kind of a new tool to put in our toolkit uh, as we're talking about caring for patients at the bedside, whether it be in the ED or in the unit of using the ultrasound to really understand what's going on inside that lung um, and what the original process is. And then how do we basically walk that back, unfold that in, in providing therapy for this patient. And so Z, I want to thank you for coming on today um, and you know sharing your expertise to help us dissect this article, to, to understand the concept around it. Hopefully for those of you guys who are listening either live now or, or in the playback on YouTube, uh, can learn something from this and maybe can spark some ideas and creativity for where you guys are working in your departments.